Hey, what's up coders? It's Maitland from Maitland Codes here. How you going? Today we're going to do uh, an extension on the last video where we started to use TCP client and TCP listener to basically communicate between a server and client. But we're going to keep extending and start to develop a chat room service that uses basically network streams. On this episode, we're going to be creating something I call a message contract, which basically defines how long a message is and the message itself. Basically, it's a, a way of serializing something over a network stream so someone can read it and know when it ends. Because the problem with a stream is that it's continuous and without a way of notifying a client how a message begins and how long it is, they're not gonna know when one message begins and another one begins and it's just gonna be read of just gobbledygook basically. So what my message contract does, it says, hey, this is how long I am, and then it writes the message. So when the client goes to read it, they read how long the message is, and then they read the message. And then they know that's the end of that particular message. And any other bytes after that is a brand new, totally different message. Anyway, let's just jump right into it, and I hope you enjoy. See ya. First up, I created a brand new .NET standard project. This is where I'm gonna put all my message contract classes as well as the serialization class. I then make sure to add a reference to my test project to the chat room lib so I can actually test any classes or whatever I put into it. And then just to keep everything clear and concise, I renamed the last test project I made from last time to chatroomlib.tests just so it describes what it actually tests. Next up, I create my message contract class this is where I'm actually going to define what the message is and how long it is, the actual contract. I noticed here that I'm getting errors for no reason, and I just thought maybe it's because it's on the wrong version of .NET Standard, change it to 2.1, and there you go, I was right. Next up, I wanted to create a separate class that handles the serialization and deserialization of my message contracts. By following the single responsibility principle, you can ensure that the code you write is a lot more testable. And for me, this means splitting my serialization code and my contract code. I start off by creating a function that's going to accept my message contract and serialize it into just a simple old byte array. I've decided here to create a null or empty check for the, the contract message. And if it is null, I'm gonna throw an error, which basically tells the consumer of my code exactly what's wrong. And by doing this, I define exactly how I want someone to use my code. I don't want someone to send through an empty message. And if they do happen to send through an empty message, it'll tell them straight away what the problem is with a nice clear error. So I encode the contract message into UTF-8 encoding and I get the bytes out of it. And then I prepare the header and I just tell the header exactly how many bytes are in this message. I have a look at the int and I see that it's 32 bits, which means it's four bytes. So I'm going to reserve the first four bytes of my serialization stream to be the header, which means the first four bytes are going to describe how long the rest of the message is. I realized here that a memory stream or a stream to write needs to accept a buffer. So there's a way around that. You can use something called a binary writer, which takes a stream as a constructor and then gives you a bunch of helper methods that basically let you say write, but it'll take in an int, a string or a char, whatever you want. Basically what I'm doing here is I'm defining a message contract, which has a header and a message. The message is basically just gonna be, you know, hello, my name's Doug, once you enter, enter the chat room. But the actual, the header is gonna describe how long the message is. And so since an integer, if we have a look over here, an integer has 32 bits of space, that means we're always gonna know the first 32 bits of the stream that we read are gonna have to be how long the rest of the message is. So that's why I'm writing, first up, the header length. Now, what I wanna to try to do is move on to actually writing the rest of the message and that'll be it. Once someone reads it, they'll read the first four bytes and they'll see how long the rest of the message is and they'll read that many bytes or bits of the rest of the stream. And once they do that, they know the next 
amount of bytes that come in are gonna be a totally new message. So, let's keep going. Next up, I want my message contract to actually have a header that is statically typed, meaning it actually exists as a class. The advantage to this is I can describe back to myself later when I'm looking at the project again, what actually consists of a message contract header. Right now, the header is just gonna contain the message length, but in the future, it will contain what user is sending through the message. And if we go even further than that, what chat room they're sending the message to. And then finally, I add the message contract header as a property to the message contract. As your handsome host just mentioned, I have no idea who that guy is, but damn, look at it. All we gotta do now is write the actual message to the stream, and then we're done. For the sake of this method though, we're gonna return a byte array, which just means returning ms dot to array, which will convert it, you guessed it, to a byte array. Next up, I'm pretty happy with this code, so I'm gonna go ahead and create a new test class. It's gonna be called, whatever I named it, serialization tests. And then I'm gonna mark it as a test class and create a test method in here, which is gonna test, as you can see by my naming scheme, the serialization into a byte array method. If you have a look at how I name it here, serialize message contract, which is the name of my function underscore what my expected input is going to be. So I'm having a bit, of, a bit of a think here about what that's gonna be. It just came to me, I guess. A random string is gonna be my input. And then my expected output, it's gonna be um, deserialized correctly. And of course, as every programmer knows, you gotta find the right song to code to. Next up, I'm gonna start writing my test. So I'm gonna create a new message contract with a message of whatever I choose. I noticed here, that I don't actually want my header to be exposed to outside uh, consumers. So I don't want someone to be able to see their header because that's always gonna be in, handled internally in my chat room lib assembly. Uh, I might change this later, who knows, but just my thought process now is, yep, I don't wanna be able to see it if, if I'm someone consuming my library. Now, I did in this test also call it deserializes correctly, so that's gonna that's gonna mean I'm gonna to have to actually write way to deserialize it. But this just gives me a real quick way to see if my serialization code actually works. Uh, you can see here that I'm just gonna check if the serialized contract is actually got any, got any length. So let's run this bad boy and see if it goes. Right click, debug tests. Sometimes Visual Studio is just gonna fucking not work for whatever reason. So all you gotta do normally is close Visual Studio and reopen it. <laughs> um, and then fingers crossed, when you rebuild it this time, it actually fucking works. Well, if you don't accidentally fuck it and rebuild this time and it works. So just close Visual Studio if something's not working and reopen it. Pro tip. So I go ahead and actually debug the test. See me bomb into the music there. <laughs> All right, so far so good. I step into that method just to give myself peace of mind as I debug it. Yeah, we get some bytes out of my contract message. I see the 97 bytes in length. It writes the stream. It writes the correct length. It sees a gobbledygook that I've put in. And then I notice that I actually want to write the bytes because I've chosen UTF-8 encoding. Otherwise, it'll choose its own encoding. And you'll see here that we've got a bunch of bytes. I'm very happy about it. And now we can move on to the next step, which is actually writing deserialization. One more thing. A really cool shortcut that I found with debugging unit tests is if you press Control R and then D, it's gonna rerun and debug your last unit test. Really helpful when you can't be fucked right clicking and going debug tests over and over and over and over and over again. Now time to write the deserialization method. So I want to name it as astutely as I can. So deserialize bytes into message contract. It's pretty obvious by the name of that method exactly what it does. It deserializes bytes into the message contract class. What this method's gonna do is, you guessed it, I hope, 
it's going to read the first four bytes to get the total length of the actual message I'm setting through. So you can see here, I, I kind of had a look at the binary reader and just having a bit of a explore with, with the IntelliSense. Instead, what you can do is you can use the bit converter, which doesn't require a, a stream. Uh, you can ask it to read int32 from just a byte array. So I delete that idiot code book before and I convert it to this new, much better way. So I've got the message length as an integer, make it a bit more concise by saying it's the byte length. And then now I want to read the rest of the array. So I skip the first four bytes and I convert that back to an array. And then I basically reverse what I did before where I went encoding.utf8.getbytes. I'm going to go encoding.utf8 they'll get string and then pass in the byte. Comment just for good luck. And then there we go. We've got a new message contract with the header. It's gonna have the length that we've read, the message byte length. And it's also gonna have the message that we've serialized. Now I'm gonna go back into my test class and change this up a bit so it actually deserializes the contract and compares both of the contracts. So it actually is deserializing whatever that text did I put there. So you see I chuck in the serialized contract bytes into my deserializer, and then I'm just gonna check if the contract is equal, or the contract's message is equal to the deserialized contract. Now I step through my deserialized method and I just, for my own peace of mind again, just double check everything's working, and it appears that it's exactly what I wanted. First time lucky. So as you can see now, we're deserializing and serializing something into a byte array. But when we go to use it in a TCP client or in the TCP listener, it's actually gonna be in a stream. And the way I'm doing it right now, you can see here, it's actually very easy because I know the total length of the bytes anyway. So let's convert this all to using a stream instead uh, to de deserialize a stream. And we'll start just pumping messages through it and see if it works the way I thought it worked at the start. So I go ahead and I create a new function called deserialize stream into message contract. Again, astutely named, so you can see the difference between that deserialization method and the byte deserialization method. And all this does is use a binary reader to read the first four bytes using read int32, because an int32 is 32 bits or four bytes, and then using the integer that it read, that's how many bytes I have to read next. So I ask it to read that many bytes into message bytes. And then all I do then is use the encoding UTF-8, get string on the message bytes, and I've got the message. Now, I don't quite want to use a TCP client and a network stream yet because it's just easier to mock up a test using a memory stream. So I'm gonna add a memory stream and I'm gonna simulate writing something to the stream. So I'm gonna write my serialized message contract to my memory stream. And then I'm gonna to wanna to deserialize that and see if we get the exact same result through the stream. One thing to note here, of course, is that memory streams, when you write to them, they're gonna they're gonna put themselves their position at the end. So we have to put the memory stream's position back at zero to correctly read the serialized contract that we just sent through. So let's have a look, step through, let's jump right into it, serializes it, and that worked. And so the next thing we're gonna do, the exact same thing, but with the serializer, because it's no help if we're just gonna serialize into a byte array, we might as well serialize as well into a string. It's not too much to change, just like before. I copied my original serialization method and then I make it a void, which accepts a message contract as its first parameter and a stream as its second parameter. I create a new binary writer and give it the stream as an input. And then I make sure to use my binary writer's helper methods to write the message length or the header length, as well as the body. As you can see, not much has changed from the original function, just that now we're serializing into a stream. I did make an error here with the binary writer uh, being disposed of as we don't want to dispose of the stream inside this method. 
Now to simulate lots of messages coming through, I wrap all of this in a for loop. And I just chuck it all in there. And then I run into a problem. My memory stream position is set to zero, which means it'll always be reading the first message over and over and over, regardless of what I do. So what I actually need to do, as I mentioned earlier, is make the serialized message contract return the total number of bytes that the message contract is made up of. I was trying to be a smarty pants here and do the position minus equals the return result of the message contract, but for some reason it doesn't work. I couldn't be stuffed to debug it, so you'll see in a minute that I change it. For now, I also wanted to make sure every message that I was sending through was different. What's the point of testing if the messages are equal, if no matter what, the messages will always be equal? So we create a new random class and we generate a random string. I changed my message contract to use my new random string. And if you have a look at the random string, you can see how wonderful it looks. Uh, and then this is what I was talking about before, non-negative number required. I have no idea why this doesn't work. Actually, on second thought, I know why it doesn't work. It's because the minus equal is happening before the position is advanced. But now that I'm serializing before the minus equal, the position is actually advanced, so I can go back to zero. And there you go, we've pretty much simulated what it's gonna be like reading and writing from a network stream from a TCP client or the TCP listener. We're going through a loop and then we're creating a random string just to simulate random chat data that someone's sending to someone. And then we're serializing that into the stream. We're pushing our position back so we can actually read the message that we've just written. Otherwise the memory stream will be at the end. We won't actually be able to read it because it'll be, it'll say it's at the end of the stream. So we just push it back by how, how many bytes that we wrote. And there you go, it's working. What we could do as well to make it even more random is we go randy dot Next, it's gonna get an integer value from 32 to 1024. So if we try this, if we run through this, the string itself will also be a random size. So this will prove that the, the message contract does tell the stream how long it is and the stream, the stream reader does read the correct amount of bytes to find the right string. So let's have a look. We've got a RAND buffer of 600 bytes. And so we've got a real big ass RAND string now. Write that, 604, goes back to zero, deserializes it, and it's the exact same stream. Now we've got a different buffer of 179 bytes. So the stream is slightly different. And if we keep going, maybe we'll find one that's seven, and that's even longer. And then we'll see the byte written is changing, it changes every time. So it's working. Wonderful. And we'll just run that to the end just to make sure we get that nice, sweet little fucking green tick. And that's it for this episode. On the next episode, we're going to turn this into an actual TCP client, TCP listener chat room service. We'll use what we've written here. We'll convert it into a class library and we'll write a console app as well. So I'll be able to type into it. It'll send it to the server. The server will receive it, send it to all the clients that are connected to the chat room. And then people will be able to chat together and have wonderful times in this isolation environment that we've got going in Australia. So I hope everyone's going well and I'll, I'll catch you next time on Maitland Codes. Have a good one.